it becomes extremely important for scientists who are purveyors of knowledge mm. to be able to communicate that knowledge really effectively. And yeah. so multiple things from, you know, if I eat turmeric, I'll never get cancer, right? Oh. You know, that's a very common thing that I get. And I always say, if that's the case, no Indians will have cancer, right? right? We have turmeric every single day. Drink rasam, you won't get COVID. Was <laughs> the other day, right? that was yeah. the I hope my mom is listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi and welcome to Big Brain Energy, a show that highlights the lives of Malaysians who have impacted the country through their work in different fields. And in this mini-series, we'll be highlighting these three topics in particular. Research and advancement in health, education and climate change. That's right. And joining Rich and I today on this chat are two very special guests, Professor Dr. Abimanyu and Jessica Oi, who will be unpacking some of their stories in cancer research. But before we get into it, a quick shout out to the Merdeka Awards Trust who are sponsoring this episode. And that's right, the Merdeka Award Trust is a trust that has two main programs under its wing, the Merdeka Award as well as the Merdeka Award Grant for International Attachment. So we've done so much research on the two of you. We've been a bit sneaky. I know, yeah we have. But could you do a, a little introduction for our audience about who you are and what you do? Starting with Jessica. Alright, hi, I'm Jessica Ui. So um, I'm a pharmacist by profession and I'm registered in the UK and in Malaysia. Um, currently, however, I'm doing a PhD in um, nanotechnology for cancer detection. And in particular, I'm focusing on ovarian cancer. Cool. Dr. Harvey? Hi, I'm a geneticist and I'm based at Sunway University, where I'm also a provost. Uh, so besides focusing in cancer genetics and really trying to find new ways in which we can better manage cancers, I'm also an educator and a science communicator. And you look after money then, right, as a provost? <laughs> we need to well, talk, speak to him a little bit later on, money. right? It's all yeah. about sustainability. But, well, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so are there any like um, misconceptions of your job when people first meet you? Yeah, there are, there are two misconceptions. Mm -hmm. One, the misconception of a job as a scientist, and the other misconception on, on cancer, cancer itself. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the job, um, I guess we all fall into specific stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, so most people imagine a scientist spends Mad most scientist. of his time or her time in the lab, and there's obviously a specific image, you know, lab code in isolation uh, and, and, anti and perhaps antisocial. You mean it's not like that? Intent. <laughs> Absolutely not. Isn't this obvious? Oh. <laughs> no. Or that. I mean, look at Jessica. Yeah. Right? I, mean, I was just amazed by how, how cool and enthusiastic and it reminds me of how I was when a PhD student. But I think my, my biggest battle that I feel and it's my social responsibility is is really breaking those misconceptions on cancer. Right. Because it really affects people's behavior. Yeah. And, and the most common thing that, that people have is um, everyone in today's world, of course, you know, are experts, right? You're experts <laughs> in everything. Even if you're not expert on something, that's an expertise, right? Yeah. To be not an expert. <laughs> um, and that represents, you know, the democratization and the empowerment. And I think it is actually good progress. Mm -hmm. But equally, uh, it becomes extremely important for scientists who are purveyors of knowledge mm. to be able to communicate that knowledge really effectively. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so multiple things from, you know, if I eat turmeric, I'll never get cancer, right? Oh. You know, that's a very common thing that I get. And I always say, if that's the case, no Indians will have cancer, right? right? We have turmeric every single day. Drink rasam, you won't get COVID. Was <laughs> the other day, right? that was yeah. I hope my mom is listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think it's, it's really demystifying some of the, the facts and maybe hyperbole that sometimes science is also guilty of. Mm. Um, is, is, is really about just humanizing the, uh, the aspect of cancer management too. Mm -hmm. That understanding that cancer is not a single disease. What Jessica was trying to talk about, that why the fact that the symptoms are all not specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there an asynchronity mm. between diagnosis and, and therapy? Treatment, yeah. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But it does not mean that there will not be a catch-up. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? I mean, that's the process of research. It's incremental knowledge of improving. Right. Realizing what I didn't know before this. Mm. Right? The unknown unknowns. Um, and so how do you bridge that gap from bench to bedside to society? Let's just rewind a little yeah. bit and, and talk about y y your kind of journeys as a health researcher. Have you always wanted to be health researchers? You know, what was that journey like? And what kind of 
What was the motivation, I guess, that led you to becoming one? Mm. Okay, this is going to be quite a long story. Go for it. We've got, yeah. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> oh, don't need to kick Sorry. the table. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, the short answer is uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, when I when I was younger, of course, you know, you grow up hearing all these Nobel Prize winners. Yeah. And you know, it's really inspiring to think, you know, what humankind is capable of uh, discovering and inventing, um, and a small part of me maybe felt that you know it would be really cool if I could be a, a scientist or a, not necessarily a health researcher but a scientist. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, fast forward several years, then um, I became a pharmacist, and um, I worked as a, a pharmacist in hospital and community. But when I think back, I realized that all healthcare professionals are actually health researchers, whether or not they're conscious about it. Ah. So, for instance, like in a pharmacy, let's say a patient brings their daughter in and did they present with some skin condition that you've not seen before, mm -hmm. or maybe you, you, have, you have an idea what it could be, but you want to be sure, so you, you need to go and do some research about it. Yeah, and so I think that's really how um, I evolve slowly um, and deciding to do a PhD is just deciding to take that one step further. Mm. and. Um, uh, so focusing. curiosity was a kind of a driving force then? Yes, mm. I would say yes. Right. Yeah, and um, just wanting to learn new things and becoming um, an expert. Although I'm far from being an expert, as more, as more things are uncovered, I realise there's so much more I don't know. Uh, yeah. And so the process continues. So like mm. Professor Abi said, it's, um, it's an incremental uh, knowledge research really. Yeah. yeah. But you said yes and no just now. Why no? Oh, um, because when I was in um, my final year of the pharmacy program, mm -hmm. we all have to do a final year project. Okay. And um, the the project that I I was doing, it wasn't something that I conceived myself. It, the idea wasn't something I conceived myself, and um, there wasn't a, a lot of time uh, uh, given for us to complete the project. Mm -hmm. uh, I just remember feeling that. Oh, you know, research is so boring. Such a waste, <laughs> such a waste of time. Oh, no. <laughs> and I already, I already had a hospital pharmacist job like waiting for me when I graduated. Oh. Uh, yeah. So I guess like, I was already kind of geared towards, right. you know, yeah. towards that. Nice. And it, yeah, it, it would have been different perhaps if um, I got a chance to conceive the idea, which mm. um, partially I got the chance to do that for my PhD. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, things change. People, people change their minds. So that's why yes and no. Nice. Yeah. What about you, Doctor? Yeah, so, you know, we are obviously a product of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in my case, I think many Malaysians will relate to me. Um, you know, being a, a Sri Lankan Malaysian, you know, if you're not a doctor, engineer, or an accountant, no, you're pretty much, you know, and it's, it's terrible, right? It's, it's, it's terrible. terrible. It's terrible. But remember, I, I was born in 1979. All right, so you know, 30, 40 years ago, in fact, you know, a lot of this, and both my parents didn't go to university. Mm. So for me, um, you know, growing up, you know, my parents gave me everything, but there was this expectation, ah. uh, you know, to to become, you know, someone, mm. you know, and 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 healthcare, you know, was something that that. And I was introduced to very early in my life, and I was really very interested. Mm. But in university, um, it's when I realized two things. One is that I, I can't cope with the death that well, and, yeah. and especially individuals. Um, and the second thing is to realize the inadequacy of medicine, mm. you know, even today. Realizing that so many things that we need to improve in the way we manage people is not within the confines of hospital or even the abilities of the doctors. Mm. It is actually in the realm of the unknown unknowns. Right. And we can only do that through research. And I was really lucky that I had mentors in the university. Mm. And really lucky again, because the, the government of Malaysia afforded me a scholarship to Cambridge. Mm. And, and while you know, I was at Cambridge, then I was exposed to you know, this amazing research environment, mm. making me even further realize that research it's not just a pipe dream. Mm. You know, research is the reason why we have everything from the lightings, the videos, why we're even sitting here. Um, it's because of that translation. Mm -hmm. And to actually then have that hope that research can then be used to improve the way in which we practice medicine. That medicine is no longer just an art, 
but it's an art that's informed by science continuously. Mm. All right, okay. So uh, of all the topics you've kind of explored, um, what would you say, which research topic um, was the most groundbreaking, the most exciting, or the most difficult for you to work with, Dr. Abby? So in my case, and it's still a continuous process, right? Yeah. Um, which is really about identifying genetic signatures. Right. Uh, genetic signatures that can actually inform the doctor how best to actually treat this individual, or genetic signatures that can actually inform scientists on what type of drugs that can be designed so that we can actually specifically target this individual. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that um, in the last 15 to 20 years, new classes of drugs, new classes in ways we actually diagnose uh, our researchers. But one of the, the biggest problems that we actually face in what we call as precision medicine versus what is called average medicine. <laughs> and that's not to allude to that we are treating medicine, <laughs> or doctors or patients you know, in a very average manner, <laughs> but it's because we treat individuals based on the average response of a population. Right. So for example, the dosage that you see for your paracetamol box is actually the dosage for the average individual. Right. But in reality, that each one of us are going to respond to a different dosage. Mm -hmm. mm. In the case of headache, the impact is not so that important. Right. But in the case of cancer, yeah. because the specific nature of the disease lends to the need to be able to identify what is the type of cancer that is not defined by just the cell type or the location of the cancer, but the actual genetic signature, which is really, I think, in the world, we actually have a Malaysian who is actually leading this field, Professor wow. Nick Serena, Nick Zainal, who is Professor of Oncology at Cambridge. Mm. Amazing work that, that she's working on. But one of the problems with this, when you try to become extremely precise, mm -hmm. you almost then try, you find very individual signatures, right. which then become both commercially unviable right. or not having the same impact from a public health standpoint. You know, sometimes the biggest problems, your biggest disappointments come from the things that actually give you the greatest joy and, and the ones that actually provide you with the greatest sense of achievement, yeah. right? Your successes are also the bane of ex, you know, your existence. Mm. And that's exactly that what drives us, right? And so for me, um, it's that exact same research question. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the people you know, out there in Malaysia, you know, which we know that are suffering from all types of different diseases, mm -hmm. if they can actually benefit from the research that is being funded by taxpayers' money. That's where I feel, despite it causing the biggest disappointments in my life, it also is going to be the reason in which I'm going to be really happy at some point when it actually helps to improve lives. Mm. Mm. Jessica, do you want to pick up there as well? Some of the, the more in the research topics that you found interesting, challenging, difficult. Groundbreaking. Groundbreaking, yeah. Um, so I guess I would say the project that I was working on, am still working on, mm. is really difficult for me. It took me um, two years to, to actually see some promising results. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm nowhere, nowhere near, you know, like commercializing a device. Right. But um, you know there was there was a lot of instances where I felt that um, I would get I would get somewhere I would make some progress and then I would hit a block a, a stumbling block and I, I would need to to optimize and troubleshoot. Did it and make you question yourself at all? I, I did question right. myself. Yeah. Like, what am I doing here? Yeah, yeah. And um, I always I, I always felt like I was going back to square one. Mm. Yeah, um, but. Um, about the thing about being in research is um, that that is the whole point mm. of it. I mean, you're not going to to always um, prove your hypothesis right away, and sometimes um, you may find things that you didn't expect to find. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think the nice thing about doing research is that you're allowed to try uh, different approaches, mm. and um, there's no right or wrong. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a journey. Absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just Google search. Yeah. yeah. This is re 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 research <laughs> And outside of the stuff that you guys have studied so far, are there anything that you would like to study in the future? 
Absolutely. What is it? Um, so I think it's the convergence of AI mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really higher computing power um, with, with, with cancer research and genetics and how we can actually use machine learning to actually help to enhance some of these signatures and patterns that I would normally be, not be able to notice, uh, but being able to use that. And I think um, we are seeing that already at multiple different levels, not just from a genetic standpoint, but even using AI. Um, at, at Sunway, we have a researcher who's working with researchers at the Sunway Medical Center and AstraZeneca to look at um, how individuals with chest x-rays, you can actually use AI to uh, also potentially detect cancer. So this goes back again to really addressing the inequities of, of, of cancer uh, or, or healthcare and, and how this can actually uh, uh, bridge. But for me, uh, personally, my biggest concern, um, I think, is manifested through COVID-19. Uh. Um, that science alone is not going to be the solution. Right. You know, for example, when COVID-19 hit us, we mm. thought by identifying the virus, we will know how to mitigate it. Mm. Yeah. By then identifying the vaccine, mm. all right, the problem is solved. Yeah. Um, but we realized, you know, human behavior human mm. is perhaps <laughs> even more unpredictable than yeah. the cancer cell. And, and really realizing this element of social science which I think is really underfunded here in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's very little research in the way in which we, we respond to stimuli and also the, the crazy forces that influences our mind. Mm. Um, for me, that's also gonna be an important thing because ultimately, even against the battle of cancer, you might actually have the best drug mm. or the cheapest drug, but ultimately for that patient to actually go and get the screening that he or she needs, and then to actually request and have the access to that therapy yeah. requires modification at multiple different levels. What about you, Jessica? Is there anything that you'd like to study outside of what you already are studying? Um, so at the moment, I'm exploiting the properties of uh, nanomaterials, so in, in particular gold nanoparticles to... Uh, Sorry, what particles? Gold, gold. nanoparticles. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, and so um, I'm exploiting the properties of these nanoparticles to, to detect microRNA. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's primarily a diagnostic uh, area, but um, there's also a lot of research into using nanomaterials for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Mm -hmm. So this field is called Terranostics. Okay. And um, I, I would like to, if, I'm, if I had the opportunity to you know, explore this area as well. Nice. Yeah. Terranostics. Yes, Terranos. Terranos. Sounds like Does a that dinosaur. ring a bell, Terranos? The word of the year so far. <laughs> Terranos. <laughs> now, um, in previous interviews, yes. you, you've spoken about um, how some of your current research came from um, a friend's late detection. Mm. Can we talk about that a little bit? Can you, can you talk us through that? Is, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so basically, this was when I was uh, still practicing as a pharmacist. I still do, but um, I was a full-time pharmacist then. And um, I had a friend. Uh, she would be my age now if she had survived. Oh. Um, but uh, I visited her in hospital for the very first time when she went for the biopsy. Mm. And that's when the doctors uh, really confirmed that she had ovarian cancer. Uh, so she went through, you know, the, the treatment, uh, the surgery to remove the tumour and everything. Uh, she was recovering, uh, she was doing well, um, but one year later, she passed on. Oh, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. Yeah, oh. so that, that was um, quite a shock, shock mm. to me, because I, I, she did seem to be improving. Mm. Yeah, and it was, just, it was just really surprising that, you know, at the, after some several months, it deteriorated. The cancer metastasized, and uh, there was nothing the doctors could do. And how, how much of that would you say kind of pushed you harder, or, or pushed you towards doing what you do? Uh, it it pushed me to do what I do. I think it, it's entirely uh, and, and entirely. I would say so. Because I mean, I um, I started my PhD. Um, uh, I, I met my supervisor and she's, she's doing research in nanotechnology based yeah. biosensors. Yeah. Um, so we had a discussion, she asked me if there was any area that I was interested in um, and uh, I just told her frankly that you know, me, I would like to maybe mm. focus on ovarian cancer, microRNA and that's how it started. The device you're working on, yes. uh, it aims to make the detection of ovarian cancer more accessible. Yeah. Um, how do you see it changing you know, the options available uh, for ovarian cancer patients? Um, 
especially those that come from maybe underprivileged communities? Um, basically, ovarian cancer in the early stages has very vague symptoms. Mm. So most women might, might not um, seek medical attention until it's too late. Mm. So the symptoms I'm, th I'm talking about are uh, abdominal bloating. Okay, which happens all the time. Happens all the time and uh, feeling full quickly after eating. Oh. Yeah, and um, you know, occasionally constipation. So yeah, in the in the rural areas and people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, it's it's even more of a challenge for them to seek mm. medical attention because perhaps they don't have access to to um, good healthcare facilities, um, and perhaps um, they need to you know take a day off. Uh, and arrange transport to, to go to a bigger city where they yeah. could you know, get those facilities. Yeah. But um, with a device that can uh, enable on-the-spot detection, so like the term for that is point of care. Mm -hmm. So basically something that can be done at the point in time and give results within 30 minutes and to the maximum of one hour. Mm -hmm. So um, at least people who might not have access to uh, testing could get tested this way. I'm just a little bit curious. This is a personal question for myself. Ovarian cancer. Okay, so there's a lot of like women's reproductive health, a lot of complications around there. What really is the difference between endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, ovarian cancer? Like, how can we tell them apart in terms of like, um, what do you call that? Like, how, how the symptoms? Symptoms, yeah. yeah. Are there a difference? Mm, well, with with polycystic ovary syndrome, mm. um, that is a little bit more clear cut. You can treat PCOS with uh, like a uh, quite a very common uh, drug available in the in the market called metformin, and you can also remove the cyst if you know it gets really big. big. Endometriosis is not dangerous as well, mm -hmm. but it is quite debilitating in terms of the pain, the pain that it causes, mm. and uh, it can be treated. But um, it's also difficult to diagnose endometriosis. Yeah. Yes, um, ovarian cancer, I guess, even harder, and the stakes are higher. Oh, God. And I just want to add, I think one of the yeah. problems with, with cancer symptoms, there's this whole group of symptoms called paraneoplastic symptoms, okay. where the symptoms can actually vary mm. so significantly, mm. and it can actually manifest completely different, that you mm. might be having ovarian cancer, but you might actually be suffering from symptoms elsewhere. And that is why the research that she's doing is really important. Yeah. Mm. The reality is that these symptoms are unspecific. Yeah. yeah. You need a more precise ability to detect mm -hmm. and you need to be able to get those individuals who need to get screened and diagnosed yeah. at the centers. And most of the time they don't go there mm. and that is where the value of the point of care testing to make it as easy as a COVID-19 test, yeah. hopefully more reliable, <laughs> but being able to give everyone that power to test it in an affordable, accessible, and a culturally acceptable manner. So what are, what are the, some of the bigger hurdles that you face being a healthcare researcher? So for, for us, I think um, there are two things. Um, the first is, is actually resources. Mm. Um, and I think um, having been trained in an institution like Cambridge where resources um, is perhaps a lot more infinite, <laughs> mm. um, being able to understand and to focus what is it that we can achieve within our resources. And I think um, Malaysia's R&D, and I think we can be really proud uh, with the research community as such, mm. um, has really grown. And you can see that through the number of publications, the number of patterns. Uh, we now actually have a very strong, um, I guess, research culture. The question now is, how can we better complement what's happening around the world mm. to actually be able to tackle the solutions that needs to be answered? Mm. Right. Mm. We should no longer be talking about what we must do or what we can do, mm. but what we have done. And I think this is really, really important for all researchers, including myself. Mm. And this is by being more realistic with what resources we actually have, how can we actually influence the policymakers to be able to provide the kind of resources that we actually have? Mm. And also to be a lot more collaborative. I think for too long, sometimes science, as you can see, it's the Nobel Prize winner, it's this you know, specific award. But 
what people don't appreciate is that these are just surrogate measures of success. Right. The ultimate measure of success is going to be about whether we actually help to people. save people yeah. on the ground. Mm. So going back to your particular question, I think the biggest challenges for researchers is how can we actually prioritize, mm. focus, so that we don't pretend that we can actually solve all problems, mm. but we can actually solve a problem. Right. <laughs> and I think that really is really, really important. Mm. Would you say gender discrimination is a challenge in, in the field? Personally, I, I don't think that I have been discriminated against. Um, uh, but, you know, the history is there. We, right. we know that gender discrimination yeah. exists. It's not something we can avoid and we can't not discuss it. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. I mean, like we talk about the, the people who discovered the structure of DNA, mm -hmm. the ones who got the Nobel Prize, Watson and Crick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people didn't know that there was a lady researcher yeah. whose right. uh, X-ray picture is what actually gave Watson and Crick the idea of the double helix and uh, she didn't you know get the Nobel Prize for it she lived in an in an age where <laughs> obviously you know she was going to be sidelined yeah. mm. um, and you know interestingly she she passed away from ovarian cancer at the age of 37 oh did she yeah she did yeah let's name her <laughs> she's Rosalind Franklin exactly yeah. Rosalind Franklin thank, thank you very much yeah, yeah. Wow. and um, Gosh. yeah so you know um, it's, it's a lesson for us. I think times have changed. Uh, there's a lot more conscious effort to, to uh, keep gender discrimination at bay. So we've got um, awards and grants which are just you know, for women researchers. Personally, I've, I've received uh, two grants since beginning my PhD. So I know Professor Abi, uh, he's got Great, like a whole on. list yeah. and I only have two. So what? Uh, yeah, but so look at just the stage of your career. And I think, sorry, I, I shouldn't speak over you, but you know, what you're displaying is this imposter syndrome that I see so many talented women that are way more talented than I am, yeah. you know, yeah. but don't have the same level of confidence. You know, so I'm yeah. sorry, but when I was doing a PhD, yeah. I never secured a single grant okay. or never won a single award. So you're way more you know, accomplished oh, at this you. stage of your career thank than you. I ever was. Well done. Thank you. So um, yeah, basically, um, I received the uh, National, uh, National Cancer Council's uh, Cancer Research Award mm. to fund my research. And then um, I was given a, an opportunity to do a three-month attachment abroad uh, by the Merdeka Award uh, Grant for interna International Attachment. Mm. So I can't say that I was discriminated against. I mean, yeah. like I, had, I have been given these opportunities. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think as completely eradicated. It, right. I think it really depends on the, maybe the, the people that you meet. And some people are still going to be, you know, um, having a superiority complex, uh, mm. you know, and um, there's nothing we can do to change people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. we can we can level the playing field, and I think that's what a lot of uh, uh, institutions uh, have successfully done. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. So we've got a really simple question to wrap up this last yeah, section. Yeah. Really right? fun. One. Really simple one. Yeah. If you were health minister for a term, what's the first thing that you'd do? All right, so... Don't steal his answer, eh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I will do is to fight the temptation to think about whether I'm going to win the next election. Okay. Oh, and actually good start. to prioritise three things. Uh -huh. The first thing is I'll make sure that I actually have, you know, the best individuals, the best minds, you know, to actually be part of my team. Mm. Because ultimately, politics and science cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. But science and, you know, can never be partisan. The second important thing is to actually have that ability to find instant gratification and actually have your research programs for a longer period of time. One of the biggest gaps that we actually have and one of the things that we had with COVID-19 was that we don't have data mm -hmm. because we don't longitudinally collect data. A lot of our data is collected retrospectively. And so we really need to create a better data infrastructure you know, on the ground, not when we are only in crisis. So that when we are in crisis, we can mitigate that or even respond better. And finally, invest, invest a lot in prevention. You know, I know it sounds really cliched, but even for us, 30 to 50% of all cancers can be prevented if you are able to modify the lifestyle, 
the, also the environment. We're now knowing more about the air pollution, right? And even different types of infections and, and what have you. Mm. And so if there's one thing I certainly want her to really be very clear about is that the generation end game for against smoking is something that she should really, really consider and really implement it. Okay. Mm. What about you, Jessica? You stole my, my idea. Oh, no, sorry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, okay, so I'm going to answer this question uh, from, from a pharmacist's perspective mm -hmm. uh, because it's always, it's always been one of the frustrating things about um, being a pharmacist uh, and I'm the thing for doctors as well. Um, so if I was health minister for a term, I would um, really set about trying to implement an electronic uh, care record which basically keeps the patient's medical histories mm. and that is accessible not just in hospitals but in community pharmacy, in the GP clinic. Ah, so I nice. think this is very, very important um, because uh, a lot of patients go into hospital, mm -hmm. maybe they're unconscious or they don't know what medications they were on. Mm. Uh, but that's very important because when you, when you go to a hospital, that there needs to be um, a medication history taken so that whatever mm -hmm. uh, chronic medicines, long-term medicines you're on gets continued and there's no duplication of the medicines. Right. right? And um, the same thing when you're discharged, when a patient is discharged and they come out to, to a pharmacy, it's, it's really, really difficult for a healthcare professional in, say, a GP clinic or a pharmacy without knowing what medications they were yeah. given in hospital. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, I think this is quite, quite a basic thing, but it will make, it will make a whole a lot, lot of difference. difference. I yeah, feel like the continuity foresee. of care. Yeah. yeah, I feel like people will be like, oh, they're trying to steal my data, they're trying to store my health. <laughs> stuff and so there, there are ways to to protect people's data, data so, yeah you know only only healthcare professionals uh, have they, access, have to, access to the database mm. perhaps mm. Uh, so it's not going to be like free for all yeah. yeah yeah but it's just for you know uh, it's, it's for the care of the patient continuity of care yeah, oh. yeah. Wait, what would you, you do what, what would i do <laughs> i'd do something similar to that i, yeah? I think the, the the communication between the gps the clinics and everything it should all be kind of mm. interconnected, interconnected, so there's so much yeah. easier communication between everybody. But we've cool. got to take a break. Folks, we're going to take a short break, but do stick around for some messages from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. A huge thank you to the Medeca Award Trust for making this episode possible. Today, we want to highlight the Medeca Award Grant for International Attachment and its goal of fostering a culture of excellence in Malaysia. What they're doing is pretty unconventional, if you're asking me, because they're providing a pathway for young Malaysians to pursue attachments with any international institutions of their choice. Yeah, so from what I know is that the grant is actually designed for young Malaysians to engage in short-term collaborative projects or programs of up to three months at institutions like Oxford, Harvard or MIT, just to name drop a few. As long as it helps build your expertise and further enhance your research or work. So boarding, fees, flight, Everything is covered from start to finish so that you can put in the hard work to achieve what you want to do during that short stint. The Merdeka Award Grant for International Attachment is open for applications starting the 1st of January till the 1st of May this year. So if you're interested, head to the link in the description for more information. You can also follow Merdeka Award for updates on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. One more thing before we get back to the episode, it's not just limited to research in health or technology, it also extends to the arts. So if you have something you really want to pursue, go for it. Now back to the episode. Welcome back guys, you're hanging out with us, Professor Abi, Jessica, Rich and myself, Sylvia. I'm just gonna jump into it. Professor Abi, just now earlier you said about how people nowadays are able to research and self-diagnose because the accessibility <laughs> of the internet. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your advice for people like to stop researching? Like I have a migraine, suddenly Google's like, you're gonna die. How do you stop people from panicking over that? Or yeah, not do it. Uh, great, great question. I think um, we can't stop people from searching because I think um, we have to also agree that the internet is a force for good, mm. uh, and you know technology is always changing and moving fast, so fast, um, and really the internet is going to be the way in which this knowledge is going to be disseminated. Mm. Um, also, to be not to be too concerned about panicking. So don't panic about people panicking, because panic <laughs> is also a normal response. It's actually yeah. a protective response, because then it tells you that to check 
and to actually then decide on what is the next action plan. Mm -hmm. If you have searched and you are concerned, please then channel that panic to the most important action, which is to sort professional help. Mm. Do you panic or deny? Which one do you do? I do both. You do both? Yes. How do you do that? Uh, mm. <laughs> 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 okay. I, I don't like going to the doctor or taking medicine. I don't I'm think anybody like, does, right? Do you, do you guys not? Like as, as health researchers yourself, do you guys? Of course. Are, are you guys scared of going to the doctor, taking medication and things like that? Uh, I'm not scared to go to the doctor, but <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do, you know, check Google if I, you know, see something unusual or feeling something unusual. <laughs> I do check mm -hmm. as well. Um, I wouldn't say that I panic, but um, it, it helps to inform me whether uh -huh. I need to, to seek medical attention or not. It's that research brain coming yeah. in. Right? Yeah. Okay. I guess. All right. Now, yeah, um, yeah. during the pandemic, we, we saw an uptick of people rejecting medicine, vaccines and whatever. Do you see the same thing happening with things like um, cancer prevention methods and treatments? Mm. Can you see people rejecting that? That, that is a, a tough question. Um, so I can see both sides. Um, and uh, I think people, you know, to a certain extent, they, they have a right uh, to choose what goes into their own body, what they're injecting into their own body. Yeah. And um, what is important is that they're given given all the information that they need to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. So mm. We, we, we cannot really vilify people who are uh, skeptical or a bit distrustful because, you know, history has shown that, you know, there have been, there have been mistakes, there have been scandals and, you know, and that's why we have governments and uh, regulatory authorities that help to safeguard the people's interest by weighing this out. Like, mm. is the benefit outweighing the risk? Mm. Right. So if it does, then you know it makes sense to um, um, encourage the pe the population to to take a new drug or a vaccine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If I can just add, I think I guess one difference is in the case of uh, say cancer vaccines or cancer drugs. Um, I think I agree completely with you that patient autonomy, because mm. ultimately the decision to then take the medicine actually impacts on that individual. Mm. But it's very different than say the COVID nineteen vaccine. Right. Because um, this perceived autonomy to choose whether to vaccinate or not to vaccinate actually impinges on the autonomy of everyone else's yeah. safe environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the difference is yeah. in the context yeah. of autonomy. Which is a nice segue into what could be a difficult question. Uh, um, those skeptics that come out and they say, vaccines and medicines, you know, they're just a way for big pharma to make money. How, <laughs> what, what do you say to those people? How do you answer that? Because there are people who do perceive it like that, genuinely. I mean, <laughs> that's a really difficult question, but yeah. I, I know. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I think we cannot, you know, sort of run away from the fact that there is, you know, this anti-capitalistic, you, yeah. yeah. um, you know, sentiments out there. Mm. But it's not so much about the fact that a company is profiting, mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually what is the impact of this focus on profits. And I think ultimately, you know, a lot of this comes from the realities that the inequities that actually exist mm -hmm. across the world or even within communities is so great. Even when we talk about the discoveries that we're actually talking about in cancer research, the reality is that a lot of the discoveries are only going to benefit the individuals that can actually afford. Yeah. So I don't think that we should channel the, the responsibility only to the pharmaceutical industry because th that's their, their model of business and that's how they, they can They're drive business. it independent yeah. of you know, government support. Mm. But we need to think about better ways in which we can actually ensure that, that translation from, like I said, the bench into the bedside and then back into the society. Yeah. From a shareholder's uh, perspective who has invested in a pharma company, they want the company to make money, isn't, yeah. isn't mm -hmm. that the whole point of investing yeah. in a company? Yeah. And um, I, companies, just like a pharmaceutical company, they have a responsibility uh, to the shareholders and they need to be profit profitable mm. in order to sustain the business. So I think like just generally any business needs to make money. Yeah. The second thing is um, the drug discovery and development pipeline is really long and requires a lot of investment, like mm. Professor Abi said. So, um, these pharmaceutical companies, they invest billions into research, researching a drug. So something that comes out into the market now uh, could have been in the development pipeline for the past 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And only perhaps one in 5,000 
drugs that were in the research pipeline gets into the market. So if companies don't make money, um, how would they be able to fund the research? Yeah. And it's not just um, uh, the research side, it's commercialization as well. So we have a lot of great uh, you know, work that's done in higher learning institutes, mm. uh, a lot of publications, you know, fantastic ideas on cancer detection, mm -hmm. you know, but um, we don't see them in the market. And why is that? Because they don't necessarily have the ability to commercialize what they have discovered. Mm. And that's something the pharmaceutical companies have. They have the infrastructure, they have the expertise, they have the resources, and you know, money is yep. so important for research. Mm. It, really de it really determines what and how far you can take your research. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so just now when you talked about behavioral science, right? Um, there's this general perception that cancer cannot be cured. To be very honest, until I was very old, that's something that I thought too. I used to say, uh, I wish cancer would get cancer and die. Obviously, cancer couldn't get cancer because that makes no sense. But what are your thoughts on this? First of all, I mean, there was actually a, a slight misconception there. Yeah. Uh, you were not totally wrong. I mean, a, a cancer can become more malignant over time because mm -hmm. the cancer cell is continuously evolving. Right. And so you're not really wrong. And sometimes these cancer cells acquire new mutations and then they die spontaneously. Oh. Right. So so you're not you're not completely wrong there. So Thick great. Brain yeah, energy. brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but now to the, to the question regarding about the cure, right? So I think, first of all, we, our understanding of what cure is, um, is actually very, very variable. Mm. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the purest sense, I think cure means that the cancer cells, every single cancer cell has been eradicated and you will never die of cancer, right? Right. Um, but um, and, and when we talk about in the context of cancer, uh, a lot of times uh, we talk about remission, mm -hmm. where an individual that has actually completed the, the treatment and the cancer cells are no longer the, no longer detectable. Right. Right. The, and and then you'll talk about how many years is that individual in remission. The reality is that there are many people out there uh, that actually get diagnosed with cancer and are living completely fulfilling lives mm. and are cancer free like forever, uh, or for a sustained period of time, at least five years to ten years. Mm. And this goes back again to the first misconception we talked about today, mm. which is cancer is not a single disease. Right. So if you have a specific cancer that is treatable because there are treatments that actually are available to you at that particular point, mm. then it's treatable. Right. The reality is that there are many cancers that are either untreated, mm. untreatable because there are no treatments available for that type of cancer, or the individual is too late. Right. In the that even though that individual may have had the cancer that was treatable, the person got diagnosed too late. Right. Mm. And that's why the work that people like Jessica are doing are so important. Mm. Jessica, what do you think is the, um, the easiest way that ordinary Malaysians can kind of contribute towards donating towards cancer research? I think that there's um, a lot of different ways. Uh, perhaps, you know, they could um, set up their own fundraiser you know, in collaboration with maybe uh, National Cancer Council or Cancer Research Malaysia. Um, the other thing that they could help with is if there are, you know, researchers looking for a, um, human subjects, not to take cancer drugs, but, you know, to act as a control group. Mm. Because we, we need to compare uh, whether the, the, um, the drug uh, works better than a placebo, which is basically nothing. Yeah. So for that, we need a, a control group. And you know, if there was a chance for them to take part in a study or a clinical trial, then you know, by all means, go for it. Mm. Yeah. That's would that be something you'd consider, maybe? Taking a, I, I would. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I'd. Yeah. <laughs> how would how would people do that though? Yeah, yeah if, I've never. Heard if they wanted to sign up for research or, or to do something like that, is are well, there well, particular um, societies they that you go to? There's always like recruitments um. for uh, human uh, subjects. Um, but it's uh, really up to the research group, the researcher, the R principal what investigator. Kind of yes, what, right. what specific mm. group of people they are looking for. Yeah, yeah specific inclusion or exclusion yes. group. And it could be healthy volunteers or it could even be individuals who actually have a specific cancer uh, where the prognosis is really bad if it's mm. you know, conventional therapy. Um, so perhaps there's this new trial drug that's available mm. and then you, know, you basically uh, get tested. But I, I just want to add one more thing that we can actually do. Um, and this goes back again towards bridging these inequities. I think um, the reality is that you know, the Malaysian public is aware 
um, and and I and I've seen the way we have responded towards many different you know pandemic uh, uh, responses, and I love that hashtag Kita Jaga Kita, right? Mm. And I think I hope this really extends to even the way in which we as a society actually helps with all kinds of different you know diseases, including cancer. Mm. Uh, when you think about the needs for cancer survivors and the families that need support, just volunteering with the National Cancer Society or the Majlis Cancer, Nagara, the Magna, and the various different initiatives, mm. going for the run, the Terry Fox run, just doing that, being present, knowing that these individuals are not alone, has got that amazing power. And I, and I think just being there and actually lending a helping hand. Cool. Let's talk a little bit then about the, the Medec Awards. Uh, and the grants that contribute to the research uh, that you're, you're working on or work towards. Tell us a little bit about that. How have they helped you out? So, um, the Medica Award Grant for Inter International Attachment um, basically funds young Malaysian researchers uh, at uh, a research institute of their choice overseas um, in a field of their choice. So, um, in my case, I went to um, ETH Zurich, uh, which is in Switzerland. Um, and I basically went there because um, they have previously pre um, done research in diagnostics then they still do work on diagnostics and um, uh, basically it was I went there to to push the, the project further along into uh, uh, actual prototype that was that was the whole idea mm -hmm. and um, not only that the experience was also good for me to see um, how research is done in in an overseas established institute mm -hmm. and one thing that I really took away and am impressed by is the collaborative spirit. In Malaysia, I find that a lot of us work in silos. Mm. So if, you, if we want to really take our research further, we need, we need ideas, we need skills from other people. Uh, we can't learn all the skills by ourselves, but sometimes if I have skill A and you have skill B, we get together and we collaborate, we can really produce something. Yeah. We, yeah which is what I, I found um, from this attachment uh, is the reason why you know other, other countries have uh, produced a mm -hmm. lot more in terms of uh, research and the output as well. Mm -hmm. But having said that, like Malaysia is a young country, especially in terms of research, mm -hmm. and being on this attachment, uh, I was able to network with other researchers, uh, even people from industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and you know this could be. Uh, like future collaborative partners. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, this attachment gave me the chance to get out there, meet people, learn things that I wouldn't have had exposure to when I, I was here. Mm. Yeah. So I've obviously had a, a decade uh, since I actually was awarded the, the, the award. And um, for me, the first one was, you know, reflecting on this. It, it actually provided me a benchmark. Mm. And I think um, just like what Jessica just mentioned, it's sometimes very easy to get very comfortable in your zone and you know you basically are a, you know, a large fish in a small little pond mm -hmm. and feel that you actually are extremely relevant. Yeah. Um, and so being able to actually put yourself out there to be assessed by the Medeca Award you know, panel, uh, to be able to be assessed uh, with your peers, and then to be able to then go out there and to see where your research has been from your PhD once you graduated, right? And you have set up everything and, and really be able to benchmark um, your success and your achievements. But what I didn't expect from that attachment uh, in, in Johns Hopkins uh, and at the Broad Institute at MIT um, is uh, a, a greater understanding of my role as a scientist, as a, also an icon in science. Uh, the one thing that I found this Medeca Award grant providing me was a platform to realize, especially with the inadequacies that perhaps existed 10 years ago and may still exist today, is that I'm not a victim. You know, I cannot sit here and complain about the insufficiencies in the local ecosystem. Mm. You know, I am the solution and I need to be part of the solution if I'm not a solution. Right. And, and for me, that Medeca Award grant really provided me that level of empowerment that I'm not just a scientist, yeah. I'm a science advocate. I'm not just a scientist to serve science, mm. but I'm a scientist to serve humanity. And humanity needs to be positioned at the center of that science. Amazing. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, right. So if um, you could give a hot tip 
to future applicants, what would that one hot tip be? Just apply. Fight that imposter syndrome. Mm. Do not judge yourself, mm. but put yourself out there and just be proud with what you achieve. Dang. That's, very, that's a really good <laughs> answer. I'm wondering how to top that. Um, yeah, so basically, um, I think the top, my top tip for future applicants of the grant that we both got uh, would be to prepare in advance. So uh, don't wait until, I mean, it's a bit too late now with the applications has already opened, <laughs> but you, you, can, you still have time to do your research. But um, when I was applying, I, um, I had actually spent the past one year periodically just going through, um, you know, like research group websites in thinking about how I could uh, join their group, like how am I going to uh, approach this group, how, what angle of my project was I going to take, which group could help me to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And um, when by the time Merdeka Award uh, Trust uh, put out the advertisement for the applications, I was already prepared, I already knew which institutes I wanted to, to go to. And um, that, that is basically what you need. You need, you need to already have a target um, and that requires preparation. So I would say, yeah, um, don't discount yourself, even if you feel like you may, not, you, may, you may not be there yet, but think, where would you like to go when the time comes? Mm. If, assuming that you're going to be ready by the time comes. So just think that way and, you know, um, apply. Like Set Professor your Adams. sights and, and exactly. go for it, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Would you want more people to come into your industry of healthcare research? Absolutely. Yeah? yeah. So if you were to give one minute, okay, maybe not one minute, <laughs> give a pitch of like why... Ooh, an elevator pitch. <laughs> yes. Okay. Of why people should study your industry essentially. The world? Uh, should I look at the camera? Or yeah, I? look yeah. at the camera. Let's <laughs> right. look at the camera. Okay. The world can only be better if we have more people asking the questions that they are most concerned about and finding new ways that old people like me cannot find solutions anymore. We need you to actually embrace the amazing wonder of things that we don't know, that you don't even know, that you don't know, the unknown unknowns. Help us answer them through the systematic process of science. And then it's not just about being better than all, but together, we can make it better for all. Wow. There's no way I'm topping that. <laughs> no? No. no. Want to give it yeah, a try? Try, you can try. I, I wish I had listened to you earlier. <laughs> you know, then I would have gotten into Sorry, research yeah, a bit earlier. corny, I know, but yeah. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> well, um, I think, you know, if you, if you have a, a passion for science, mm. um, and in particular health sciences, um, I would say, once again, you know, if you're a student in school, give your best at what you're doing um, and really, really, you know, uh, s strengthen your fundamentals. Mm. So whether it's biology, chemistry, maths, um, go deep, you know, don't leave any stone unturned. Um, and that's where you will, you will get questions in your mind, um, questions that don't, don't have an answer already. And that could be a, a potential research topic and yeah, so basically, I'm, I'm just going back to the, the curiosity again. Um, yeah, just always be curious. And um, yeah, if, if you know, this is your passion, uh, don't let anyone tell you that it cannot be done. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for yeah. the advice and the stories. I hope everyone had a good time. Uh, join us next time. We're going to talk more about climate change and education in Malaysia. Uh, for now, we're going to say goodbye. Bye. Bye.